The French are back and now roam some of the countries they once ruled. But for humanitarian intervention, we need military operations. My guest tonight co-founded Doctors Without Borders. The international community is doing his best and it is not enough. Witnessed genocide firsthand. In the UN, there is no NGO, there is nobody. And as former French foreign minister, he argues that the West, regardless of borders, has a duty to act. I'm Mehdi Hassan, and I've come here to the Oxford Union to go head to head with Bernard Kushner, one of the strongest advocates of the so called right to intervene, which some say he invented. But can military intervention ever be strictly humanitarian? Or are Western countries just reviving their colonial past? Tonight, I'll also be joined by Lindsay German, who runs the Stop the War Coalition, Barak Sina, Associate Fellow at the Royal United Services Institute in London, and Hamza Hamushen, a political commentator, founder and president of the Algerian Solidarity Campaign. Ladies and gentlemen, Bernard Kushner. One of Europe's best known politicians, he headed the UN mission in Kosovo. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you. You are considered to be one of the founders of humanitarian or liberal interventionism, what you've called the right to interfere and what the UN has called the responsibility to protect. Can you tell us, in a sentence or two, what this concept is all about? It depends. It depends on the law, it depends on the Security Council of United Nations, etc. But what is important, do we have to take care of the people by prevention, not to authorise, not to let the, the killers uh, uh, kill the people, mass massacre, genocide, etc. Do we have to stay inert or not? As doctor, as doctors, we answer no. What, what would you define? What's the definition of the right to interfere? First, you don't have to mix the humanitarian action and the political action. For, of course, or the military yeah, action, which is where much of the Military action, lies. yes. But of course, in case of war, you have to protect your doctors, at least, and the patients also. First the patients, second the doctors. So don't mix everything. We were moved by the fact that we had, it was our duty, and our oath to take care of the people. And as for the doctors, it is better to prevent than to cure, than to take, I mean, to, to, to take care of the patient after. Uh, we were obliged, we were obliged, and we did change the international law. Yeah. As one of the architects of humanitarian intervention, what would you say to those people, especially in the developing world, in the global south, who say that in practice, this so-called right to interfere, to intervene, is only ever exercised by Western powers, by people in the North. Developing countries don't get to go around intervening in developed countries. It seems to be one-way traffic. This is not completely untrue. But who is supposed to protect the people? The people able to do so? The people involved? I mean, the, 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 let's say the good Samaritans? Let so me read to you a quote from David Reef, who used to be a big supporter of humanitarian intervention like yourself, but then became very disillusioned with the whole idea. And he wrote a few years ago, quote, when a British or French minister proposes a UN resolution calling for a military intervention to make sure aid is properly delivered in New Orleans, then and only then can we be sure to have put the spectre of imperialism dressed up as humanitarianism behind us. He's got a point, hasn't he? My opinion, if I may. Yeah, this show is all about opinion, your opinions. Maybe. There is no imperialist victim and non-imperialist victim among the civilian population. There are no bad victims and good victims. There are no bad dying people and good dying but there people. Are, there, are there are countries are who have an imperialist agenda, some would argue, and, and hiding behind humanitarian I defend doors. the victims. I'm always on the victim's side. In France, for example, your yes. country. Very nas proud nationalistic country, great legacy in history. <laughs> what about UK? 
Are you coming from Indeed, UK? Indeed, the UK is as well. But I'm, uh, as well, I'm, I'm, not, all, I'm, not, interview, I'm not interviewing the former British foreign minister tonight. Unfortunately, they are all nationalists in that time. Agreed, agreed. But given we're talking about France and you're French, let me put this question to you. I'm answering, I'm answering to you because you are of course, British, I'm British citizen. And I'm British, so and, I'm British, and if you read my stuff, I'm no fan of British government foreign policy. I'm very anyway, happy to do this as a sort of exchange. Let me, you know? let me get the question out. In 2017, yes. if Marine Le Pen the leader of the National Front is elected president of France and starts persecuting French Jews, French Algerians, French Moroccans. Would Israel or Algeria or Morocco have a right to intervene in France to protect those minorities? I think that it will not be necessary. We'll protect the Jewish ourselves. Okay, but if it wasn't happening, you would accept that an outside country could come into France to protect your minority population? It was exactly the case in that during the Algerian war. Unfortunately, we had to go to war during eight years, very bloody war, and we were wrong. Okay, well, let's, we're going to try and run through lots of uh, conflicts in brief time. Yes. Would it have been easier, as some argue now, to have intervened in the conflict in Syria today had Iraq not happened? Unfortunately, we did not. Unfortunately, I was strongly in favor at the beginning, at the beginning, because now it is a bit difficult. All the, the, the actors have changed position and political involvement. But at the beginning, I think, and I propose that, that it was possible to avoid the bombing of the civilian population. Was it uh, better with uh, Bashar al-Assad uh, oppressing, of our oppressing freedom, in fact, and uh, arresting the people, violation of human rights, etc.? Uh, do we have to stood on his side or not? I think we had to say that it was a dictature and nothing else. I'm on the Syrian people's side. Of course, all the millions of refugees, they are waiting for peace. How can we, uh, let's say, impose peace? This is very difficult. And not this is the only difficult, but they are supported by Russia, by Chinese and other Arabic countries. But better to stop the war, of course. How to stop the war? Do you have a recipe? No, neither me. Okay, well on that note, let me uh, bring in our panel uh, who are with us tonight from across the spectrum. Uh, Lindsay German is an anti-war activist, president, uh, He's right. or, or one of the people who runs Britain's Stop the War Coalition. Um, Lindsay, you've opposed a fair few wars in your time, but surely you would accept the principle then in some cases where a massacre is happening or about to happen, there is a principled case for people who have the means to stop that massacre to go in and do it to hell with international law. I don't accept it at all. And the reason I don't accept it is because we have a long history now of so-called humanitarian intervention, which has led to more people being killed, has led to more devastation. We've seen Libya, which is a complete disaster area now. Places like Afghanistan are still racked with all sorts of problems so that they had. So intervention almost always makes things yes, worse. Yes, and we're always told it's to go in to stop a massacre. In reality, when you look at the events that take place, it is not to do that. That wasn't what Afghanistan was about. It wasn't what Libya was about. It wasn't what Iraq was about. So, so I am against this. Are you saying that humanitarian is a cover? It is a cover, and it's interesting. You've been having the discussion with Bernard about exactly where and who intervenes, and it is the major powers. It's about certain countries and certain rulers okay. who aren't liked by the Western powers. Okay, well, on that note, let me bring in uh, Barak Sina, who's an associate fellow at the defence think tank, the Royal United Services Institute in London. Uh, you are a supporter of the principle of intervention and military intervention. But surely you would accept Lindsay's point that it's not always about humanitarian goals, is it? Sometimes it's about good old fashioned geopolitical interests. And yeah. we use the language of humanitarianism as a bit of a cover. If you're going to look around the globe to see the different crises or ethnic cleansing, genocide that are taking place, there has to be three pillars that will guide your foreign policy. There has to be capacity of resources. There has to be your ideals and there has to be your security interests slash economic interests. If there's an issue of nuclear proliferation, if there's an absence of governance, that's the number one thing on any national security strategy. You've got to go in. You have to have a degree of military intervention. You can't ignore it. But when a, when a Western leader, quote, a French leader, a British leader, an American leader says, we're going in to save the people, do you believe them? A lot of people say, we don't believe it. I think that there's going to be a, a degree of that being uh, 
motive because it's precisely a country which is a failed state that is likely to be a sponsor of terrorism but also abuse its domestic infrastructure to abuse its own citizens. Let me bring in Hamza, Hamza Hamushain is a human rights activist, chair of the Algeria Solidarity Campaign. Hamza, in a country like Syria, where tens of thousands of innocent people have been killed, some of them by chemical weapons. How long can you do nothing militarily if you have the means to set up a no-fly zone or arm rebels with better arms? Looking simply at history um, will tell us that the Western powers intervene when their interests are endangered, intervene to maintain their domination and expand their influence. How can we believe that these Western powers um, intervene for the sake of the people when they support other atrocities okay, and crimes, let's put, let's put um, like the state to, of Israel? Let's put like, that point to Bernard Kushner. Rhetoric is easy. But how can we trust the intentions of the same people who back dictators and tyrants elsewhere while claiming to protect people in this part of the world? But I'm not pretending that so we are civilizing the world. I pretend very clearly when you that this is a... better to save one life than not to do anything. If you cannot understand that, sorry for you. If it is your cousin, your brother, your mother, you will ask me to intervene. No, no. Lindsay German, I, very briefly. You're confusing two different things. Sorry? You're, talk, you're talking about your role as a doctor yes. and people's role as a doctor. That is quite different from what people in government are doing. The Hippocratic Oath surely says, first do no harm. Mm. No, certainly, certainly not. The Hippocratic, the Hippocratic Oath, it wasn't the argument against us. This is a, a relation, a very particular relation between one patient and one doctor. Not the mass massacre, not the genocide, not the big killers. The problem with these yes, wars that yes. we're talking about is innocent people die in them. Lindsay's point is that when you go in to prevent a massacre, often other massacres happen, sometimes at yes, our hands. Yes, yes, absolutely. So it's not that easy, That is, is it? not a reason not to stop. Because it is a reason if you end no, up doing more harm than good. Simplicity is, is not always wrongness. I'm explaining you why we wanted to protect the people before the killing. Because this is easy to say, I'm here to take care of the patient. If they are dead, the patient, this is not enough. France, Britain and the US armed the rebels in Syria and escalated You're the war. You're mistaking. If you really interested okay, hold on, in hold the position. Hold on, let him come back in. We are not arming the rebels. We wanted to arm at the beginning, at the beginning, and we were unsuccessful. We wanted to arm the Democrats against the dictator. It was simplistic, but it was true. Unfortunately, they have been replaced by terrorists and killers. You mentioned earlier, just a moment ago, you mentioned that you would like to prevent a massacre before it happens. But I, I, I wish. Yes. Libya. Libya yeah. is a classic example cited by people who say example, that yes. by going into Libya in 2011, yes. the French led the charge alongside the UK and the US. Yes. To, we went in to avert a massacre in Benghazi, That's true. and that was a humanitarian intervention. The problem is, of course, it then turned into regime change. Gaddafi was toppled. French and British special forces were calling in airstrikes. Our air forces were basically acting as rebel air forces. The UN resolution said, simply protect civilians, but we went all the way to Tripoli and took out Gaddafi, was then pretty brutally killed. How can you say it's a humanitarian intervention looking back now, given it didn't stick to the strict parameters of protecting Benghazi? At the beginning, it was something to protect the citizen of Benghazi, and it was right. But I'm sorry, there is some rules. Uh, you cannot just eat and leave. And certainly, we had to, 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 to protect the people. You have to be, uh, let's say, human rights fighter by advance. To protect human rights is a long, long story, and this is difficult when you are marked up. Are you really and saying that you didn't, you yes. went into Libya no, to protect Benghazi, not. and we just got carried away and ended up in Tripoli? Yes. Really? No. <laughs> no, but we, were, we did. You That's didn't go exactly into Topol Gaddafi. Did. That wasn't the original intent. No, certainly not. It was not. We came in the name of the Security Council, and we overrun. The and many of those Security Council members say you violated Resolution 1973 by going That's all the way to Tripoli. That's not completely untrue. Okay. <laughs> but uh, uh, at the beginning, I, I we came... That that's, a, that's a new one for me. Not completely untrue. Post-Gaddafi Libya. Something you, else that's not... to be used because I, I will use it several times. Please do. Please do. Let me use it. What's not completely untrue also is that post-Gaddafi Libya isn't the greatest of places to live today. Not only it was not completely true, but it was right. Okay. The so people. you open Pandora's box and you walk away uh, and you say you're still bit, on the side yes, of the victim. Yes, a bit. Yes. Okay. 
That's sorry to be uh, in agreement with you. No, 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 no. I'm glad you're in agreement with me. I'm glad you accept what went wrong. Just very quickly, before we move on from Gaddafi, he was a vile dictator for many years. And yet, four years before France decided to take him out, he was in Paris on a state visit. He was doing sightseeing at Versailles. He had pitched his tent next to the Elysee Palace. You were the French foreign minister. Sir, that I refuse. But your government invited him. You can't wash your hands. I, I told Sarkozy, I'm not with you on that... Uh, why didn't invitation, why didn't and I refuse to as meet As someone who's always on the side of the victims, why didn't you resign from a government which invited uh, Gaddafi to Paris and called him brother leader? Why didn't you resign and say, this is outrageous? That was a contradiction in politics, yes. Okay, well, let's bring in Lindsay German, who was a... Do you want to respond to the point, Bernard, made, that you're on the... As a pacifist, you're on the side of people like Gaddafi, I'm not a pacifist, and I, I don't always take the view that wars are wrong. <laughs> but I think that the wars that have been... that have involved the United States, Britain, and France, latterly, with, uh, with particularly with Libya, I think have done tremendous damage to the world. I think the world is a much more dangerous place than it was in 2001. People talk about the threat of terrorism. There is now the threat of terrorism across large parts of Africa, large parts of the Middle East. Do you accept that had France and Britain not intervened in 2011, people, innocent people would have died in Benghazi at Gaddafi's hands? That may well be the case, but innocent people have been dying this year because the country is divided, the country is in a form of no, civil you, you, war, there is no government, but you and the situation already. is certainly not better. And I think the real question here, Hamza touched on it, is does yeah, I, France and Britain and and the United States, do they have the right to tell other countries what to do? And you cannot simply okay, talk gonna... about this as if it's just doctors going across okay, borders. Let me, let me bring, that isn't what let me bring it's in, about. Let me bring in Barack well, It was a military intervention in order that the British okay, and the French the... fighters, I mean the planes, uh, uh, let's hear just from... avoid okay. the killing of the, the people, but it was a military okay. intervention. Okay, let me bring in, hold on, let me bring in Barack yes, Sino, but without any patient. humanitarian involvement, any... Let me bring in Barak Sina. You would accept that Libya, which we were told was a humanitarian liberal intervention to protect human rights, it wasn't about oil or security or terrorism, it was about protecting people in Benghazi, is today a pretty much a disaster zone. There's the law of unintended consequences. That doesn't undermine the legitimacy of intent. And the fact that there was a legitimate intent, it means that there is a Pandora's box that will be opened up. Perhaps you can mitigate the law of unintended consequences and that Pandora's box by increasing military intervention and ironically perhaps engaging on a neo-colonialist state building enterprise. Now it's precisely those people that are against such intervention that are against state reconstruction and there's a reason why we Western states are intervening for a couple of reasons. Number one, we have greater legitimacy than developing states simply because of our human rights ethos that they lack, because they haven't had a social contract, they haven't had liberalization. Secondly as well, our our military expenditure is a product of our GDP in general. Countries with greater GDP are going to have greater militaries. So, Countries that so, don't have so GDP. Very, very briefly, you're, you're, in, you're all in favour of China intervening around Asia, because they have quite a big GDP last time I checked. No, but they lack the legitimacy. <laughs> Hamza, Bernard talked about the reality of the world we live in. Mm-hmm. You know what? In the, rea- in the real world, you have to accept double standards. I don't see them as double standards. I see them as a consistent pattern of backing authoritarian regimes and providing them with weapons to oppress their own people. You said it very clearly. The, the enlightened Western leaders were supporting Gaddafi and entertaining good relationship with him before the Libyan uprising. And when they saw the opportunity to go and topple the regime and put a more compliant puppet regime in its place, they went for it. We don't learn our lessons. Humanitarian intervention is just a facade of liberal imperialism. We've seen it how you destroyed Iraq. Uh, the situation in Afghanistan is disastrous. Libya now is becoming a center, exporting instability, militant okay. and violence okay. to the to, uh, to, well, to, let me, to the let me, take you, let me take up the panel's points and come back to Bernard here and ask you this. The law of unintended consequences in Libya, one of them was that fighters ammunition, weapons, came out of Libya into Mali, which then triggered another intervention by France in Mali. How can you have a doctrine which involves military action, which has all these Pandora's box moments, all these unintended consequences? Don't you think I'm very sorry to tell you that in Mali this is not the case. Mali was not linked to Libya. I I didn't answer to such uh, an evidence. 
No, I said that Mali, for the time being, this is a success. For what? For the freedom of women. For the fact that the people, they are not oppressing the women in Tombouctou, that wasn't my etc. Yes, but it was my answer. Okay. okay so, I, no, me, no, 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 Yes, I, I don't deny the UN point. I don't deny Thank improvements you. in women's. I'm asking a very simple question. Do you agree that the better. French intervention in Mali was triggered by the French intervention in Libya? Yes or no? No. We were asked by the people, all the government, all the ministers in, uh, in Bamako, they asked us to intervene, and we did. You also went in alongside the Malian army, which has been accused of massive human rights abuses, yes, of, of abuse. unlawful killings, but, um, torture. Absolutely. Amnesty International says the Malian security forces record yes, is yes, simply yes, appalling. Yes, 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 you yes. had no qualms about being no, on the same side as the no, Malian army? we suppressed this power. In Af uh, of, uh, have we been accused of French troops or the African troops working? I'm simply wondering, as someone who says is a humanitarian on the side of the victims, does it bother you that when you intervene in such places, you end up finding yourselves on the, the side of rather unsavory but people, whether it's Libyan such, rebels but or Malian army? are the country question. of the truth. We intervene and stop this power of the so-called uh, uh, Malian army. You didn't to fight the Malian army? Of course not. We suppressed the power of the guy who is, was in power after a coup d'etat. We okay. suppressed that. And what do you say to... Uh, no, okay, I'm, are you in agreement or not? Not quite. What do you well, say... Well, not quite, that is to say yes. What do you say? Uh, it's not untrue, to use a phrase. Uh, <laughs> what, um, now you are getting what, better, Mehdi. What would you say to <laughs> Sergei Lavrov, the, former, the Russian foreign minister, who said last year when he was talking about these Al-Qaeda-linked rebels in, in Mali who were getting weapons from Libya, he made the point that France is fighting against those in Mali whom it once armed in Libya against Gaddafi. Got a point, hasn't he? Yes, that's true. The arms were coming by the southern part of, of Libya to Mali. It was partly true, yes, certainly. And I, I didn't support... I told you that this Libyan operation was badly, if I may say, very quickly prepared and not prepared at all. And it was not the way to protect the, the population. But you, but yes, we protected you're, you're Benghazi, being, but we didn't protect but the this rest. Is the this is the point, the unintended consequences. this is the point, of Well, course, no, yes. unintended consequences. You say, I want to go in and save lives, you said at the start. We have to take action but to prevent massacres. successfully. Benghazi was not erased. What I'm all. saying to you is this, that when you do it, you have unintended consequences. No, no, later. no, we, we protect Benghazi population was not bomb, okay? That was our purpose. After you were right, we a bit overrun the, 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 the resolution. That's true, unfortunately. We okay, we're going to take a break there. Uh, you're watching Head to Head on Al Jazeera. We're going to be back after the break. We're going to be talking about the Balkans, about Kosovo. We're going to be talking about Rwanda, the hey. intervention that never was. We're going to a break. You're going to have to wait a second. Oh. <laughs> and we will be back with a very okay, combative don't be former nervous. French don't foreign be minister. Quiet, quiet, quiet. Bernard this Kushner. is a difficult subject, Mehdi. Don't be papa pa 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 Welcome back to Head to Head on Al Jazeera. We're talking about humanitarian intervention, the right to intervene, the right to protect one of the architects of the doctrine, the former foreign minister of France, Bernard Kouchner, uh, who joins us here in the Oxford Union. Bernard, why do you think it is that the intervention in Kosovo in 1999 is considered to have worked, have been a success in a way that Iraq isn't, Afghanistan isn't, even Libya isn't? It's seen as the, the, the benchmark, the role model for interventions. Why is that? Because I was in charge. <laughs> you, were, you, were, you did run Kosovo for two years, the UN administration yes. after. Yes. Um, and we considered the people as equal, and we tried to convince them that the UN system, because I was in charge in the name of the UN system, was not uh, taking side. We were just stopping the massacres and offering to the people, the Kosovars, because they were the majority, large majority, 
to run their own affairs. So we did. And at, at the end, now, and thanks to them, and congratulations to the Serbian government and the Kosovo government, they are talking to each other. And not only they are talking to each other, but this is, I think, one of the, let's say, UN success. There were a lot of problems associated with crime and criminal networks in Kosovo. Like in, in all fact, the Balkans. Like in, in all the Balkans. Indeed, and some would argue it got worse after the war. But listen to what Amnesty International said about the UN administration mission in Kosovo, which you were in charge of between 99 and 2001. They said that your administration, quote, singularly failed to investigate the abduction and murders of Kosovo Serbs in the aftermath of the conflict. That's why we offer a vote to the Kosovar and the Serbian, and they did it, yes. Yes, a, a war is cruel, you know. Assassination in a war, this is the way not to win. Hold on, how does but that work? War is cruel. Not, no, no, war like, cruel. Exactly, like exactly it exists in all the war. And we were very, let's say, devoted to all the inquirement. One murder, we rush to the place, we send the police, etc. Et Amnesty doesn't agree with you, they're wrong. But okay, but they were seated on the us, and we were in charge. That's a very different. And this is not a, a perfect... It was with not respect, as someone who claims to be a champion of human rights, I'm sure every authoritarian government in the world might say amnesty is sitting on its arse and we're in yes, charge. That's I not really an excuse, I do is it? repeat, the people who said so, they have never been there. Because we did our best. Amnesty have never been to I, Yes, 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 I thing. say so because I was in charge okay. with my people, with the UN. So there was so, of people. So Serbs weren't driven out of Kosovo, Roma people weren't driven out of Kosovo in the wake of no, the No, but this is not only in Kosovo. Of course they are killing each other, unfortunately. And we not only we I protest, you went in to stop but the they killing. are no longer killing each other, but talking to each other. So this is a good result. When I came in, during months, every night, every day, assassination, I don't say that we stopped the old killings in the, uh, overnight. No, but it was not the same scale at all. Huh? One million people were displaced in uh, Montenegro, in Albania, etc. So in two months, we allowed them to come back and to rebuild the houses. But don't critique everything. Tell me what we were supposed to do. And in that side, <laughs> I mean, we did our best and we refused the clash in between the two communities. The Albanian, the Muslim Albanian Kosovars, and no the Serbian. Is, no one is criticizing everything that was done, and people are accepting good things or not. I'm asking you, if you go to war in the name of human rights, really? and you carry out human rights viola violations, you blow up a TV no, station, you blow up a No, we are not carrying out. It was NATO That's a bombing. Is not, it has been accepted by the member of NATO. All the countries of the world, but Russia, OK? and Chinese. Bon. So it was not my duty. I, I protested. Every victim has my, not only my compassion, but my support and the families. Okay. But uh, okay. what can I do? So was it, was it a reason, was it a, a good reason not to be involved in Kosovo to make peace? We did make peace. Let me just deal with another country. Rwanda is a place where Every humanitarian interventionist says yes. the West should have intervened yes. in 1994 when Hutu militias killed up to 800,000 yes. people in the yes. space of 100 days. Yes. Genocide. Yes. The problem for you, maybe, or for others on your side of the argument, of course, is that France did intervene in Rwanda. The problem was it intervened on the side of the people doing the killings, the Hutu militias. President Paul Kagame Don't say Rwanda. So, but it was true at the well, beginning, yes. President but Kagame says was? France played a direct role in the Medi. political preparation of the genocide. Do you know where I was in, in April? Inside the genocide. I was in Rwanda. I'm the only one. The French soldier has been accused to participate. They were not participating at all. They didn't kill the people. They were respect, in charge. That's pedantry. No, 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 they didn't no, kill no. the people themselves, but they helped the people who no, did. Come on. Not a, they, they helped the people before, in the, let's say, three years before, because they were training the army. But of course, the army, the Rwandese army, part of them, they, they became, they became militia, but not all of them. And the French soldiers never kill anybody. Everything that was prepared was prepared with France's implicit consent. That's a sure thing. Do you know who said that's that? Too much. You know, I, 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 that's I, too much. You said that in April 2014. Yes, that's too much. I said so. That's too much. Did you not feel a little bit ashamed as a humanitarian? I was became? not. No, I was not. In France that has never apologized for its role in the Rwanda no. genocide. Belgium has. France has yes, never. Yes, and including, and Clinton did. Yes. But Why not the French? when I was, please, when I was, uh, foreign minister, 
we reconciliate, we reopen the diplomatic yes. relation and with Mr. Sarkozy, not only we visit Rwanda, but Kagame visited France. So I did my duty. Why not apologize? But <laughs> I was not in charge. I criticized, as you said, okay, Turquoise okay. operation. So do, you think, do you think the French government should apologize for its role in Rwanda? <sighs> yes. Let's go to our panel who have been waiting uh, to come Talk in. You've been hearing us talk about Kosovo and Rwanda. Uh, Lindsay German, violence happens in that part of the world. They had to stop the war. You can't be a perfectionist. Killings were going on, but the killings came down in Kosovo. There's a great deal of myth and uh, um, uh, untruth told about Kosovo. It was a situation where you could have had a peace solution, except they forced a war at the Rombuya Agreement. They forced a war on the Serbians. They, they gave them conditions they couldn't possibly meet. They bombed for 78 days in Serbia. They bombed Belgrade. the refugees that Bernard said came back home? The refugees were people who were only refugees after the war started. So they were people who were escaping from a war. And this is such a dishonest way of, actually, way of actually approaching the thing. And if you look at Kosovo today, I would say Kosovo has a very good case for being one of the greatest failed states, not just in Europe, but around the world. It is a center of drug running, of, uh, of gun running, of prostitution. It is not a state which anybody could be proud of. So why you can just say this is okay, all let me, perfectly let me bring okay in, and it Let me bring in Barak Is anything Kosovo anything a state that, anyone can be proud of? Sort. If I'm responsible for my intent at the moment of decision making, would it be moral for me to say, let them kill one another, let there be genocide that yes. will take place because what may happen afterwards may be worse. Let me bring in Hamza. Policy of inaction could be equally immoral. Rwanda, if Rwanda happened today, a clear-cut case of genocide, would you support an inter-military intervention to stop that? I think when a humanitarian crisis is developing, um, the outsiders have three choices. Either they act to escalate the crisis or do nothing or mitigate, uh, try to mitigate the circumstances. I think the Kosovo and the Rwandan crisis fall in category number one. Um, what happened actually in Kosovo is that the crisis escalated after the NATO bombing has started. And this is a predicted uh, consequence uh, according to the commander of the NATO forces of, of the time, who declared himself that the political leaders were not interested in ending the ethnic cleansing. But then we need to look at the bigger picture what was happening at the same time the same year 1999 turkey okay let's briefly make that point the double standards point is often raised well, turkey, Tur turkey actually is a member of nato and they were committing the most atrocious crimes against what the kurdish populations okay. what did you do no, what did you do what did you do no but it's don't easy to don't, criticize don't well, you, you are protesting because we are intervening but you are not intervening enough on a, on a personal note, okay. how did you go from being a communist student ah. hanging out with Fidel Castro and Che Guevara in the 60s in I Cuba? Was, uh, strongly. How did you go from that to being a member of one of France's most right-wing governments under Nicolas Sarkozy and telling Condoleezza Rice, we will never betray America? Because I became intelligent. <laughs> so good up. No, so I <laughs> So you weren't I was not, before. I was not. Okay. No, because I published before the election a book, en français, pardon, deux ou trois choses que je sais de nous. And in that book, as I was traveling all over the world and I knew what happening in globalization, the people were working, they were, we are not no longer the center of the world, we are not no longer able to be arrogant, European people, not only the French. And so, I, I, I facing the crisis who was coming, financial and uh, fin uh, not only financial, but uh, deep cultural crisis that we had to be together, the left and the right, on a program of reform, necessary program of reform. That's why I accepted what Sarkozy proposed to seven members of the left and socialist party. And you were and expelled, I, 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 was, and you were expelled was, from the socialist huh? party? Sorry? And you were expelled from the socialist party for joining his government? Yes, which is, is normal. They are stupid, they are stupid. Do you, they're, they're stupid and you're intelligent. No, but the so problem is still the same. Do you think Look, you moved to the right over your political No, career? not at all. I never voted in favor of the right. Never in you my life. You just joined the government of the right. No, they propose a, a national unity. I think so. And what is going after the, really the election? National unity government was because it was, it you don't, are not involved in politics, Sarkozy sometimes government. you are not understanding. Okay, national unity means what happened in Germany, 
where the Socialist Party is governing with Madame Merkel, and they are but right. The Socialist Party didn't join Sarkozy. You did. No, that's not really. A national I am unity sorry government. for them. They not follow. They were not following me. <laughs> okay. I'm very sorry for that. But I think that it was the good method to accept to make all together a national movement to reform our country. And I'm still thinking the same thing. Let's, go, let's go to the audience. We've been talking tonight about Syria, about Libya, about Mali. Let's go to the audience and let's go to the back first. The gentleman there with the glasses, four rows back. Yes, you. Um, I was actually almost convinced with your passion for uh, humanita humanitarian intervention, but uh, just consider the statement that when Western powers intervene in a country um, in the guise of humanitarian aid, it's more a bane rather than a boon for those countries. I mean, if you look at it, uh, the, the enmity of Western powers is far better than the friendship. So how would you react to this, this statement? There is a, a very good answer for that. Ask the victims. We were not just pushed by our <laughs> sense of, uh, let's say, uh, uh, the, the change of the world or, or humanitarianism or universalist uh, attitude. We were called by the victim. Ask the victim. This is, they are the only people okay. able to answer Let's to your Let's go back question. to the audience. Let's go to the lady in the front row and then we'll go to the gentleman next to her. The public are so used to this duplicitousness and are now sceptical. For instance, the invocation of R2P responsibility to protect was used to legitimise illegal interventions. What kind under of the interventions do you think? Uh, Iraq, about? Afghanistan, Libya, Syria. It's used. This propaganda is used. This rhetoric is used. Ukraine? Uh, Ukraine? No. Indeed, Ukraine. It definitely, uh, absolutely. On the rivers. Yes. Absolutely. Um, yeah. Uh, and it's all under the guise of moral humanitarianism. Yes. I would like to ask you, how would you defend that? Are you f is it forbidden to have a moral, to have an ethic of, let's say, not leaving the people being killed by dictators and not dictators, government? If it is so, I'm in favour of the intervention. Thank you. Would you agree with the view that when engaging with its European partners, France is far more likely to be able to assume a position of leadership in the field of military intervention rather than humanitarian assistance? No. Okay. I mean, we never intervene in the recent government, that is François Hollande, without the clearance of the UN system. Never. So it was because of a UN resolution. Let's go to oh, a woman in the back, please. Um, you mentioned a couple of times that you believed that uh, we should have speak up a bit. You mentioned a couple of times that you believed we should have intervened in Syria earlier on. Can you please explain how that would have ended up in potentially a democracy by now, since there isn't really that much um, evidence of other times after intervening, intervening in that area leading to peace? Her question was, what would the end game have been in Syria? Would it have turned it? What evidence is there that Syria would have become a democracy after we militarily intervened? No evidence. You cannot just rule the, the world. This is impossible. Unfortunately, in a way, fortunately, in the other, people, the people, the nation exist. So what? Are we in charge? We are talking about the protection of the victims. That's all. That's all. For the rest, we are no longer in the time of colonization. OK, let's take some more questions to the audience. Gentleman there in the black tie and the suit, do you want to wait for the microphone to come to you? And then we'll go to the lady next to you. Ah. My question is, do you believe it is now essential for there to be reform of the UN Security Council if the responsibility to protect norm must survive? Of course, yes. But unfortunately, we try and try, and for the time being, nobody is in agreement for the reform including and especially the reform of the Security Council. You have no representative of Africa, we have no representative of Latino America, etc., etc. And of course of Asia, China, and that's all. That. I promised the lady in red the next question. Um, I'd like to ask and focus on the issue of MSF, which hasn't been mentioned and as a co-founder. Yeah, Doctors Without Borders. Yes, Doctors Without Borders. Thank you. So, um, as a Kenyan myself, I'm from Africa. Uh, one of the things that I found is that NGOs often have this paradox, right? So on the one hand, they're seen as these humanitarian saviors that come to places like Kenya, where there's the Al-Shabaab, C-A-R, where there's the Seleka versus the Balaka. One of the, but on the other hand, when you look at MSF, the actions are often followed by French troops. So how would you react to people when they ask you, is MSF just another engine that protects French commercial interests? Thank you. You are partly right. I mean, the NGOs are made of women and men like the other 
organization and then they said let's all the the system but uh, i think you're a, a, this is a bit too much you accept the people we they have never been involved without a call people were calling them people some of them a community a big village a big town etc otherwise this is not a, a humanitarian intervention lady there with the glasses and then i'm going to go back to the back of the hall so be patient you mentioned the case of Kosovo, and there's it, the, my question is about what happens after intervention. When you were in charge of the UN there, and all the inter-ethnic violence that happened, and the way in which minorities mostly did not return to Kosovo, from your experience, what lessons can the international community learn from that case for any other post-conflict situation? Thank you. You know, what I have learned from all the cases I've been involved in, this is hatred, and certainly also confrontation in between religion. But it was not the case of Kosovo at all. But well, you know, you are always surprised by the level and the, the magnitude of hatred. People killing the other. Could you imagine what it was the meaning of that in Kosovo every night? It was in between Kosovo also, not only between Serbian and Kosovo. And the Kosovo. So that's, this is not a lesson I know about violence. But uh, are we supposed to react or not? Because this is very good to have this catching match. But I want to convince somebody, only one of you, better to intervene and to protect one life or not to intervene. And protect lives who may be lost in that intervention. No, no, no. Let's no, go no, to no. the gentleman who's waving his hand. When we are talking about uh, the intervention, how about the Russian intervention and the Iranian intervention in Syria? And another thing, uh, yes, we need to uh, protect and save uh, minorities in Syria, yeah. but they are not affected by the Free Syrian Army. They are affected by the Syrian regime as well. But as well, it doesn't mean that uh, Assad uh, is allowed to kill and slaughter the majority. The majority of Syrians just under the umbrella of protecting the minorities. Are you Syrian yourself? Uh, yeah, I'm Syrian. I'm a Syrian and activist. Would you like to see a Western military intervention in Syria? We would like to see any kind of pressure to force Assad in uh, just leaving the country to step uh, back and leave the country. Yeah. So we are not intervening enough? You yes. are not? No. Okay. And just like I, I was, I, I told you to answer to your questions, I was completely in favor of bombing the airport at the beginning because what? Not because he was not a dictator able to, uh, to protect the, 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 the Turkmen, no. Because he was bombing and killing the civilian population Sorry. massively, which was against, of course, and the Geneva Convention. Do you think that would have stopped him? Do you think airstrikes would yeah, have stopped him? Oh, I think so at the beginning, Finally, yes. one more Really, thing. just a bunch of airstrikes would have forced him to run no, away? No, not to suppress the, the airplane. Yes, of course it was. But what about, okay. One more thing. Uh, Very briefly. Yeah, 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 we, saw, we started uh, our revolution, uh, civilians protesting in streets. Okay. We're still We're fighting for our freedom. Point. Very strong so, point. No, 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 but I support what you said. Okay, Absolutely. you support him. He's made his point. Well, let's take this lady's question, then I'm going to ask a question to the audience. Um, so something that came up a number of times, which I think is maybe worth going back to, is the question of the link with the 19th century, because a lot of these neo-colonial accusations um, generally point to the past of France or England. Um, and while they, I think it's important to remember that they don't say that colonialism and neo-colonialism are the same thing, they do say that there are some disturbing echoes. And something that is really important to remember about the 19th century, which I think we've dismissed here, is the fact that it was both about interests in resources and whatnot and about intent. There is a very real question of the link between the sort of civilizing mission which was genuinely felt. Therefore, can France actually, in light of its past, unless that? there is, a, for example, a reform of the Security Council, ever claim we got it wrong the first time around, but this time we're doing the right thing? Can it have any credibility, any legitimacy? Thank you. You are, your reproach is have no solidarity with the people? What do you mean? I don't understand. Are you against the position, the French position on what? Don't say we are intervening in République Centrafricaine because we have interest. This is not true. Médecins Sans Frontières and your humble servant received the Nobel Prize for Peace. You're talking, Why? But Why? you're taking it very According personally. We're talking about a concept that you're no, here to defend. No, but you didn't receive that to you. Um, that's the first guest who's ever slapped me on the hand. Um, I feel very told off. <laughs> The gentleman at the back has got his hand up very high, he's been waiting a while. I agree, when you come up with an idea of something good to do, and people say, no, it's a bad idea for this reason, but suggest nothing better, that's very frustrating, because they're not contributing to your effort to do something good. 
I think the core of the problem, of the issue that people are taking, is to do with risk. It seems to me that you think whatever the risks involved, it's better to do something rather than nothing. I've been always in, in the, the, let's say, the third world or the poor world side, always, all my life. What do you mean? OK, well, let's, before, we, before we go, and we're finishing now, let me ask one final question, which I'm sure you'll really enjoy, uh, given the mood you're in. <laughs> You once said... An, I'm ready to... You want for the worst. It's the last question, so I think I'll chuck it at you anyway. And it's an important question. It's a very important question. You once said that the most important thing you've ever done in your life yes. is the right to protect. Yes. And you've said that tonight. You've been very emotional about the right to protect people. And clearly, the humanitarian interventions that have happened, the so-called humanitarian interventions, have saved lives. Many innocent people have been saved. Thank you, Mehdi. I've conceded that from the very beginning. What you haven't conceded or what you don't want to dwell on is they've also cost a lot of innocent lives. My question to you is, as someone who's pushed this right to intervention very passionately, very emotionally, do you often think the lives of the innocents who are lost as a result of those wars are on your conscience? Sorry, this is just ridiculous. It's so ridiculous to ask We believe you that you... we have saved a lot of yes. people and some died yes. not because of the intervention, yes, only because, because of, because the, of the situation. I mean, you are completely let's say, on a torrent of negation. OK, be negative, but the people asking to be safe, asking to be part a lot of, of an people. international involvement, thank you for them, because they are much more numerous than the victims you are intending to <laughs> ask me to cause, to, to, to prove me that we cause the victims. This is not true, okay. absolutely untrue. Well, we save the people, and in Kosovo particularly, what was right? that we were not intervening in Rwanda, and it was a big, 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 big vote, international vote, not only the French, not only the French, all together. I want to give you the last word. Oh! Because you're feeling... <laughs> do you think... Do you think... Do you think the right of interference is now established? It's not going away? Unfortunately, it's... after this session, certainly not. <laughs> I understand some of the criticals were right. Of course, this is not perfect. But it is much better than okay. doing nothing. Well, doing great... nothing is easy. That's Pacifism a... is a very good idea. Unfortunately, it doesn't work. Okay. Be good. On that note, Bernard Kushner, thank you very much for joining Head to Head tonight. Thank you very much. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you. Thank you to our very... Thank you to our very opinionated panel, our very passionate audience. Thank you to you all for watching at home. We'll be back with Head to Head next week on Al Jazeera. Good night.